Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for having me at Nodes this year. I'm very grateful to be here. So human beings are embedded in social networks. And these networks obey very particular biological, psychological, sociological, and mathematical principles. And taking this into account offers us tremendous opportunities to gain new insights into behaviors and also to change them. We can use an understanding of social network structure and function for good, to intervene in both online and offline worlds in order to enhance our health and our well being, our public policy, and our business objectives. And in the broadest possible sense, taking human embeddedness in networks seriously shifts our focus to the externalities of interventions. That is, it engages us in the exploration of how it is that when we intervene in a group, we affect not just the people that we target, but also all the other people around them. I'm interested in real social networks, the kind we humans have been making and embedding ourselves in for tens of thousands of years, and not just the recent online variety. Real social networks look like this. Every dot is a person. Every line connecting them is a relationship between two people. Who's whose friend? Who's whose coworker? Who's whose sibling or spouse or neighbor, for example? And these social networks are intricate things of beauty. And they are so elaborate and so complex and so ubiquitous, in fact, that one has to wonder, what purpose do they serve? Why are we embedded in them? How do they form? How do they work? And how do they affect us? And I've spent the last 20 years researching how and why human beings form social networks and how they affect our lives, our health, our desires, our feelings, our thoughts, and our actions. Now, part of this work has involved exploring the biological predicates and consequences of social networks and the evolutionary basis for social network structure and function to begin with. Social networks, you see, afford the people within them different possible structural positions. And I'm gonna introduce these ideas right now and we'll return to these basic points. There are a number of mathematical ways we can understand what it means to be in different parts of a human social network, but three of the simplest ways are illustrated on this slide. First of all, there's the number of connections that an individual has. So once again, this is a network, every dot is a person, every line represents a relationship between two people. And if we look at this network, we can see that node B in the upper left is different than node D on the far right in that they have different numbers of connections. B has four connections and D has six connections. This is known as the degree of a node, this number of connections, and people know this about themselves. People know how many connections they have, for example, or at least they can know it. But now we, with this bird's eye view, can see that there are other possible structural locations within the network that individuals might not be able to appreciate about themselves. For example, if you compare nodes C and D, C is in the middle of the network and D is on the periphery, they both have six connections. And if you talk to those two people, that might be the limit of their understanding of how many connections they have. But we, with this bird's eye view, can see that C and D are very different. And I can cultivate this intuition in you by asking you, who would you rather be if a deadly germ was spreading through the network? You should have the intuition that it's better to be D, that D is gonna get whatever's spreading later in the course of the epidemic, if they get it at all. Conversely, who would you rather be if a juicy piece of gossip were spreading through the network? You'd rather be C. And because you have the intuition that C's in the thick of it, they're gonna get whatever's spreading sooner in the course of the epidemic and are more likely to get it. So this property is called the centrality of a node, how central the node is in the network, and this can be quantified mathematically in a number of ways as well. Last, if you look at the nodes on the far left, A and B both have four connections. But the difference between the two is that B's friends are not connected to each other. They're not friends of each other, but A's friends are connected to each other. This is known as the transitivity of a node, whether your friends are knit together or not, and this might also affect your fate in life. Your ability, for example, to work together in a group might depend on whether your connections are in turn connected to each other. Now, one early project that we did in my laboratory was to look at the extent to which these three properties are heritable. This graph shows the, uh, the extent to which this is the case. On the y-axis is the percent of the variance that's explained or the heritability by your genes to what extent do your genes explain these properties? 
And on the x-axis is the three properties. And on the far left, what we show is that 46% of the variation in how many friends people have can be explained by their genes. Now, this is not very surprising. People vary. Some people are born shy. Some people are born gregarious. People vary in their taste for friendship. But we also found that 47% of your transitivity can depend on your genes. And this is one of the more bizarre results to come out of my lab in the last few years. Because what I've just told you is that if Tom, Dick, and Harry are in a room, whether Dick is friends with Harry depends on Tom's genes. Whether those two people over there are friends with each other depends on my genes. How can that be? Well, we think the reason is that people vary in their tendency to introduce their friends to each other. Some people knit the networks around them together and some keep their friends apart. And last, if you look on the far right there on the centrality, 29% of the variation in how central you are in the network can depend on your genes. We think this is related to whether you have a predilection for befriending popular or unpopular people. If you befriend popular people, now you want four popular friends, I want four unpopular friends, that'll put us in different positions within the network. So the fundamental reality of our desire for connection and our susceptibility to social influence, it turns out, has always been with us. Where you are in this vast fabric of humanity depends in part on your genes. And our lab has been amassing evidence that it is indeed not a coincidence that we form social networks with particular mathematical properties. We've shown that there is an evolutionary significance to and heritability of social network structure and function. And that phenomena like peer influence, how we affect each other, and homophily, the fact that we tend to prefer the company of people we resemble, are of fundamental significance. Across evolutionary time, it seems, that the benefits of connected life must and do outweigh the costs. Now, if social network structure has genetic antecedents and significance, it begs the question of how ancient this structure is and whether we might be able to document such structural features in human populations living in non-industrialized settings. In other words, the fantasy experiment we would love to do is to say, well, okay, could we fly back 10,000 years ago and map the social networks of our ancestors and see what kind of networks they made? Obviously, we can't do that. So we hit upon what we think is the second best thing, which is to map the social networks of the Hadza hunter-gatherers. The Hadza live in, uh, around Lake Ayasi in Tanzania in the ancestral human environment. They live like we did during the Pleistocene. They hunt and they gather for their food. They have no material possessions to speak of. They sleep out under the stars. Uh, and there are only about a thousand of them left that live in this very ancient way. So what we did is, is, is we prepared a photographic census of all living adult Hadza using 10 years of field photographs. And we printed them onto these posters like a kind of Hadza Facebook. And we went into the field and every time we could find a Hadza person, we asked them to tell us who their friends are. And we therefore painstakingly mapped the social networks of the Hadza. And we found a number of things. First of all, we found that Hadza networks look both mathematically and visually just like ours, just like modernized networks. In other words, despite the fact that in the last 10,000 years, we've invented agriculture, we've invented cities, we've invented telecommunications, the networks that we make are just like theirs. You see, network structure Likely, and, and this is consistent with the very ancient origin of network structure and consistent with its partially genetic basis. Now, while we were there, we also found something else. This is an image of the Hadza network among women in the Hadza. Every dot is a person. Every line, again, represents different kinds of social relationships. We make the dot size and color related to how generous and altruistic people were. We had the Hadza play what is known as a public goods game. We gave them some resources and we said, if you share these resources with your neighbors, we will double those resources and you'll get back a fraction of what you, know, you shared with others. So you have to pay a little sacrifice. You have to make a little you know, uh, sacrifice, but everyone else will benefit more. Uh, and so we, the, the yellow dots are the high donation people, the more cooperative people. The red dots are the low donation people. They're known as defectors. And if you look at this, you can see that they're clusters of nice cooperative people and mean defector people 
located within the social network. And this clustering of cooperative behaviors within the social network is also consistent with the ancient significance of human social networks. I'll come back to this with some experiments in just a moment. Now in a parallel, an early stream of work uh, that we also did in my lab using both observational and experimental methods, we and others have provided evidence that a variety of behaviors and phenomena beyond germs spread within our networks, beyond just dyadic ties. In other words, when you affect your friend, when you influence them in some way, your influence doesn't stop there. It keeps rippling through the network. And the challenge is to, to document that, <coughs> to document the extent of that and the reasons for that. And across a wide variety of phenomena, we found that people's influence tends to spread to three degrees of separation, to your friends, your friends' friends, and your friends' friends' friends. And that this happens for a variety of phenomena, like obesity, smoking, drinking, and drug use with emotional states like happiness, loneliness, depression, or behaviors like altruism, like I just showed you in the Hadza, or with things like criminal behavior or voting or purchasing behavior or ideas. People's attitudes, decisions, and behaviors depend in quantifiable ways on the attitudes, decisions, and behaviors of others to whom they are directly or indirectly connected. A key idea about networks is that networks magnify whatever they are seated with. If you put something in a network, the network functions like a kind of social magnifying glass. It makes more of it. But the network is agnostic. It doesn't care what you put in it. Networks will magnify Ebola or COVID or fascism or violence or fake news. But equally, they will magnify love and kindness and happiness and productivity and ideas but something has to impinge on the network to get the process started. Now, of course, there's more going on than just this kind of social contagion I just alluded to. For instance, in the case of the contagion of obesity, several things might be happening. For example, the first thing that might be happening is straight up social contagion or what you might also call induction or a social domino effect. I gain weight, it makes my friend gain weight. My friend gains weight, it makes my friend's friend gain weight. There's a kind of spreading process in the network. Another possibility is that it's not my weight gain that causes your weight gain. Rather, it might be that birds of a feather flock together or homophily, which is love of like. Maybe I befriend other people because they have a similar body size to me or a similar taste in exercise or in foods, for example. A third possibility is that it's neither that my weight gain causes your weight gain nor that we form a connection because we have a similar body size, but rather that we share an exposure to something like a, a gym that makes us both lose weight or a fast food joint that makes us both gain weight at the same time. And all three of these are typically present in any social phenomenon. For example, why are, why are people buying a particular product? Are they buying a product because their friends are buying that product? Do people who like that kind of product preferentially form attachments to each other? Or is the marketing campaign of the firm really effective at getting many people to buy the product? So it takes effort using diverse statistical and experimental techniques to tease these sorts of effects apart. Here's one early experiment that we did to isolate social contagion. In this experiment, groups of college students were brought into the laboratory and they were randomly assigned into groups of four strangers, these little boxes of letters shown on the left-hand side here. And uh, they were given a little bit of money and they were told that if they gave a dollar, let's say to their group, we would double that dollar so that the group would gain $2 of wealth and each person would get a fourth of that because there are four people in the group. So you give a dollar, you get back 50 cents but your group gains $2. So obviously the best thing is for everyone to give maximally. This is called a public goods game. It's an economic model for human altruism. The best is for everyone to give maximally. But of course, from a selfish point of view, what you really want to do is give nothing and hope that everyone else gives. But of course, if, if everyone thinks that way, nobody gives and then nobody benefits. So what we did is, is we put these people into this type of a challenging situation and they played one round and then a bell would ring and they would play another round and a bell would, with, with new people, then they'd be randomly assigned to new people. Then a bell would ring and they'd be randomly assigned to new people and play again. And as a result of this, we were able to create simple artificial linear networks 
where we could trace back the sequence of interactions that previous individuals had had. And what we were able to find is that this kind of altruistic effect could spread from person to person. So for example, what we found is that if Eleni is kind to Lucas in period one, Lucas is kind to Erica in period two, Erica is kind to Jay in period three, and Jay is kind to Brecken in period four, a kind of cascade highlighted in red on this slide. And this is another one of the most bizarre results to come out of my lab in the last few years. Because what I've just told you is that how Jay treats Brecken depends on how Eleni treats Lucas, <coughs> even though neither Jay nor Brecken ever saw or interacted with Eleni or Lucas. How two members of this audience treat each other may depend on how two other members of this audience treat each other, either, even though neither pair ever interacted with any other member of the other pair. So this is an experimental documentation of social contagion. And this geodesic through the network spread of, of altruism is distinct from the, from the temporal persistence of altruism highlighted in yellow. In other words, if Eleni is kind to Lucas in period one, Lucas learns to be kind. And he's kind to Erica in period two, and Lysander in period three, and Bemi in period four, and so on. In fact, if you fold back all the downstream benefits for every extra dollar that Eleni gives Lucas, the network functions like a kind of matching grant, doubling the downstream benefit. Or one other way of thinking about this is that pay it forward is real. Now to be clear, we are affected in another way by social networks. It's not just what's happening around us that matters. The actual structure of the network also matters. Think about these two objects that you all studied in high school chemistry. They're both made of carbon. And on the left, you have graphite, which is soft and dark. And on the right, you have diamond, which is hard and clear. And there are two key intellectual ideas here. First of all, these two properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness aren't properties of the carbon atoms. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms. And second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Take the same carbon atoms and connect them another way, you get a completely different set of properties. Similarly, the pattern of our connections affects the properties of our social groups. It's the ties between people that make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. New properties, such as cooperation and violence, health and happiness, innovation and productivity can emerge because of the connections, because of the ties between people and not necessarily because of the people themselves. So it's not just what's happening to the people around us that matters, whether they are happy or rich or thin, for example, our experience of the world also depends on the actual structure of the ties around us, near and far. Let me give you one of my favorite examples of this. This is some work done by my colleague, Brian Utzi, uh, who became unaccountably interested in the success or failure of Broadway musicals. And he put together a data set of 326 Broadway musical production companies. And he mapped the social interactions of the teams producing these Broadway musicals. You know, the director, the producers, the musicians, the actors, and so on. And he computed something very similar to the transitivity that I introduced a few slides ago. So on the far left, you have, let's say, six people. You have the person in the middle, there are five people to whom that person is connected to, and there are five times four divided by two, 10 possible connections among those people, but none of them are present, so you have 0% density on the far left. In the middle, four of those 10 uh, connections are present, so you have 40% density, and then next over, all 10 of those ties are present, so you would say there's 100% density. And then he plotted uh, in, the far, in the cartoon on the far right, he plotted the density of the social structure of the ties among the members of these Broadway musical production companies on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, he quantified the success of these Broadway musicals. Now, Broadway musicals take hundreds of millions of dollars to, to make. They're high stakes, high risk business ventures. And he quantified the success either in terms of the money that they made or the fraction of positive reviews. And he found this parabolic shape. In other words, towards the lower end, towards 0%, if nobody knew each other from before, the show was a flop. 
And at the upper end, if everybody knew each other from before, the show was a flop. Optimal innovation and productivity was achieved in the middling range of density, where maybe some people knew each other from before and could work together effectively, and other people were fresh, brought in fresh ideas and created a new chemistry in the group, which allowed the group to be more productive. So these sorts of observations have suggested to us three broad ways to intervene in networks so as to enhance public policy uh, and in various ways to use social networks for good. We can manipulate connection, which has changed the structure of the network, or we can manipulate contagion, which is to change the flows through the network. And finally, in a way I'll come to in a moment, we can manipulate position, which is to change the location of individuals within a network. And there's expanding science in all three areas using both online and offline settings and I'd like to give you a feel for some of our results. These results are all from experiments, but we have other findings as well that uh, from observational studies that I won't be presenting today. So over the last few years in our lab, we've developed software that we call Breadboard that allows us to easily recruit um, uh, test subjects, including on Amazon Mechanical Turk or other settings, and, uh, and create temporary artificial societies of real people. Uh, so we can, in a kind of godlike way, socially engineer different social arrangements, seamlessly recruit research subjects, drop them into these little worlds, have them interact with each other, pay them money for their trouble, and, uh, and then experimentally manipulate these in order to test ideas experimentally about social organization. By the way, we've made this software publicly available. It's at breadboard.yale.edu. Here's some work involving the manipulation of connection uh, that I mentioned that illustrates both the use of the software and this principle of the importance of social connection. Uh, we took hundreds of research subjects. We randomly assigned them to different worlds uh, in which they were dropped into networks which obeyed different rules. On the bottom, uh, we dropped and then they played multiple rounds of a public goods game uh, across time. Ten rounds, for example, is shown on the bottom where it says one, two, six, and 10. That's the round number. This game took about 40 minutes to play. So in the bottom side, bottom row, people were dropped into a fixed network. Uh, they were dropped into one of the, the network structure was determined and they were assigned a location as shown by the uh, blue and red dots. And the color, in, and then they were given some money and they were asked, would you like to share this money with your newly assigned neighbors? If you do, we'll double the money, everyone will benefit, but you have to pay a little price. Of course, you hope that your neighbors will reciprocate or you can defect, you can be a red dot and, uh, and not contribute and hope that others contribute. And what happened in that, in that branch of the experiment was that about, a, about two thirds of the people were nice blue dots, cooperative, altruistic, kind people at the beginning, but they were taken advantage of by their red neighbors who abused them. And so why, did, why should you keep contributing if your neighbors are mean to you? Uh, you start defecting as well and also not contributing. And across time, what you find if you trace out the lower row is by the end, uh, everyone has uh, converted into a defector. You've got a sea of red dots, except a few blue dots on the edge of the network, keeping civilization alive. In a different branch of the experiment, however, in addition to asking people whether they wanted to, um, and, and, and by the way, that branch of the experiment is typical of the kind of experience many of us had in high school when the teacher randomly assigned you to be with a, you know, some, uh, some people and in a work group to do a project and said, you're all gonna be given the same grade, you have to work together. And if you were assigned with people who were lazy or incompetent, you had two unpleasant choices. Either you could do all the work because you wanted a good grade and they would get credit for having done nothing, or if that annoyed you, you would also stop working and then everyone would get a bad grade, including you. That's the dilemma faced by the people in the bottom row. In the top row, however, in addition to giving the people the option of whether in this public goods game, whether to be generous to their neighbors or not, we also gave them a little bit of ability to manipulate their social connections. At each time step, they could cut ties to people who were defectors or form ties to people who were cooperators. And in that branch of the experiment, as you can see, cooperation persists. So in other words, I could take a group of you, 
and 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 randomly assign you to one regime of social connection and you'll be really sweet and nice to each other. Or I take the same people and assign you to a different regime of social connection and you're mean jerks to each other. So it's not who you are that matters. It's how the network is organized and structured that might elicit this property of cooperation, just like the carbon example I mentioned a few minutes ago. In a subsequent experiment, we explored the parameter space of the rewiring rate, this social fluidity that I mentioned a moment ago, whether you could break or, or make ties using hundreds of subjects in dozens of groups. Uh, and on the, on the y-axis, I'm sorry, on the x-axis here, we put the rewiring rate from zero to 100%. 0% rewiring means you're in a rigid network, you have no control over your social connections. Five and 10% means a little bit of control. 100% means every time step, every one of your social connections is up for renewal or can change or does change. And then in the middle is everything in between. And on the y-axis is a, is a regression-based uh, estimate of how cooperative the groups are. And here you see a parabolic shape. What this says is, is that if, if you're in a rigid social structure, cooperation is low. And if you're in an overly fluid social structure, cooperation is low. And the optimal cooperation is achieved in a middle range. This sounds like the result with transitivity that I told you earlier, but it's completely different. This is not transitivity, this is social fluidity, which again has this parabolic shape. And I can cultivate an intuition in you in this by asking you to think about different kinds of institutions we have in our society. For example, the kind of institutions related to marriage. If you live in, an inst in a society in which marriage, there, no divorce is possible on the far left, social rigidity. Once you pick your spouse, you're stuck with your spouse forever. If your spouse is mean to you, your choice is to rem be kind to your spouse forever and have them take advantage of you, or to also become mean, both of which are unpleasant. So, but meanness rises and sweetness declines in that kind of regime. At the other extreme, if you constantly have a new spouse, if every day you're assigned a new spouse, there's so much fluidity, you have no incentive to ins be nice to your spouse because they're not gonna be there tomorrow. So what you want is a regime in which divorce is possible, but not too easy. You want a set of institutions that move people into middling levels of social rigidity. And I would suggest the same kind of thing happens with work groups on, uh, in businesses and firms. You don't want overly rigid work groups, but you don't want overly fluid ones either if you wanna optimize cooperation and actually other properties like innovation within these groups. Here's still another experiment of ours, a more recent experiment. This was published in 2015, manipul manipulating another feature of our social interactions, um, namely whether we can see each other's wealth. This is a complicated experiment with many results, but let me give you some highlights from this experiment. Once again here, we dropped people, we recruited hundreds of people into dozens of groups. Actually, there were 1,400 people in this experiment who were put into these artificial societies. We gave them real money to play with, and we randomly assigned them to be rich or poor, and we have a lot of money or little money, and we randomly assigned them to be in either unequal, uh, very unequal, slightly unequal, or very equal social worlds. For example, here on the left, we assign people into a very unequal social world, which is measured by the Gini coefficient, which is a number that goes from zero to one, and it's 0 0.41 on the lower left. That's a very high Gini that has a high level of inequality, like Morocco or the United States, for example. And, uh, and then the dot size is proportional to how much wealth people have. And then we put a little letter R for rich and P for poor, which is what you're assigned at the beginning, the amount of wealth you're given. And then in one branch of the experiment, uh, in the invisible condition, uh, people now start playing the same public goods game I've been telling you about. And the color of the dots indicates uh, the blue dots are the nice cooperative people, the red dots are the mean defectors. And they play multiple rounds of this game. And you can see in that on the left-hand side of this slide, in the invisible condition that by the end of the game, many things have happened. The inequality has plummeted from 0 0.41 to 0 0.14. That's actually below Scandinavian level of inequality. All the dots are big, everyone has gotten rich. And most of the dots are blue, most of the people are cooperative. 
That seems kind of nice. In a different branch of the experiment, we flipped a switch and those people were put in the visible condition where they could see their neighbor's wealth in addition to their own wealth. And in that branch of the experiment, none of those outcomes obtained. The inequality stayed high, 0.38 and 0.36. Most of the dots were red defectors and you don't have as many wealthy big dots produced on that branch of the experiment. So making the wealth of others visible was bad in this situation. And here's a summary of some other results from the same experiment shown differently. <coughs> on the x-axis, we have the round across time as people play these games. And on the y-axis, we have the average wealth produced in these societies. And we had a two by three factorial design. We had six branches of this experiment where there were three different initial inequality conditions, no inequality in blue, low inequality in red, high inequality in yellow, and then two different visibility conditions, dotted line, the wealth was invisible, solid line, the wealth was visible. And if you can look at this slide, you find that actually, unexpectedly actually, in my case, the inequality didn't seem to corrupt or affect the ability of the group to produce wealth but the visibility really did. When you made the wealth of others visible, you decreased the ability of the society to produce wealth. And the same kind of finding was ob obtained uh, with respect to uh, how cooperative these societies are. Here again on the x-axis is the round number. Now on the y-axis, we put the proportion of people who are cooperators and you find the same results where inequality doesn't really affect people's cooperativity but visibility really does. Now these findings have implications for all kinds of policies in our society. Everything from pay secrecy in firms uh, or sports teams or school uniforms in schools. I used to be very much against school uniforms um, for various reasons. They struck me as kind of fascistic. Uh, but you know, when we did this experiment, I began to kind of think of school uniforms as a kind of cloaking device, a kind of invisibility cloak that you know, maybe uh, uh, had the students focus on other things rather than on competing in terms of how wealthy they were, you know, manifesting their wealth, for example, or social status. Here's another result on the importance of network structure uh, because we become interested in the sharing economy and in ways to optimize it. And we built a game that captures, now this is a more recent experiment, that captures some pertinent features of the challenges of sharing. Imagine wireless routers in people's homes and that people can share the excess capacity uh, when they don't need it. They leave their house. The neighbor can use their uh, wireless capacity. But then when they come home in the evening and their neighbor's away, now they can borrow some of their neighbor's capacity. And in this game, people had to choose whether to share a resource that was essentially useless to them with their neighbor in the hopes that their neighbor would reciprocate. And using this scenario, we, we assessed how satisfied people were, and we randomly assigned people into two different network structures. And again, this is a complicated experiment, but the gist is kind of powerful in my view. Here, there are two different networks that are drawn on this slide. Both of these networks have 15 people. Both of these networks have 18 total connections. Even more than that, both of these networks have the same distribution in the degree of connections between people. For example, that little figures that are shown on the left there, if you look at how many people have one connection, six people have one connection in both networks. How many people have two connections? Three people have two connections in both networks. How many people have three connections? Three people have three connections in both networks. And how many people have five connections? three people have five connections in both networks. You basically couldn't tell the difference in which of these two worlds you were in. Same number of people, same number of ties, same number of people with the corresponding number of ties. And yet, when we drop people into these networks and have them play the Wi-Fi sharing game, you get completely different levels of satisfaction according to whether or not the network is organized to be assortative or disassortative. In an assortative network, Popular people are connected to popular people and unpopular people are connected to unpopular people. In a disassortative network, it's the opposite. It's like an airplane network. H hubs are connected to small cities. So in a disassortative network, popular people are connected to unpopular people and vice versa. 
And what we found was that the assortative organization, was, which is what humans do, humans are organized in assortative networks, was optimal for satisfaction in this situation. So structure again matters, just like the carbon example. And we can engineer different structures of human groups to optimize different outcomes. Now, moving on, we can also perform experiments that manipulate contagion. For example, this is a paradigm of experiments we're conducting that illustrates how you might manipulate contagion, for example, in sets of villages or in, or in sets of firms or in factories or in work groups or in classrooms, for example. Imagine you have two villages, the one on the left and the one on the right, and you have just enough money to teach, to target six people, the six yellow dots, with a public health intervention. For example, to teach people how to use a latrine or a vaccine intervention, for example. Uh, and, and the ordinary perspective in public health is you give those six yellow dots the intervention and you come back a year later and you ask, well, how many of those six people adopted the intervention? Maybe three of the six. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in response to treatment among the treated. I'm interested in response to treatment among the untreated. When you go into this village and you give those six people the intervention, I wanna know what everyone else in the village does. Maybe you target those six, you give them the public health intervention, three of them adopt, and maybe three of their friends also adopt. For a total of six people in the right-hand village and in the control village, maybe two people adopt the practice. But now you should be thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't pick the six people at random. Maybe there's an intelligent way to pick the six people so I get more bang for my buck. And the answer is that that's true. Instead of, for example, picking six people at random, maybe you should pick six central people. Maybe you target six people again, maybe three of these people adopt, but maybe they persuade 30 of their neighbors to adopt. Same village, same intervention, same number of people targeted, 10 times the effect because you have shrewdly used mathematical algorithms to target structurally influential people within the village. And then you can experiment with all kinds of algorithms, which is one of the things that my lab does. For example, one of the algorithms we use is an algorithm known as the friendship paradox. And this is the idea that your friends have more friends than you do. This is a mathematical fact about social networks. And I can cultivate this intuition in you by asking you at least to consider the people on the periphery of a network. For example, that person on the very far right there has one connection. That's why they're on the edge. They only have one tie, but their friend necessarily has two, more than one connection. In this case, two connections. And in fact, if you look at the bottom, dot, bottom yellow dot at the bottom of the slide, their orange friend has eight connections. And so for everyone on the periphery, their friends will have more friends than they do. It turns out this is a mathematical fact everywhere in the network. On average, your friends have more friends than you do. So if you pick the six yellow dots at random and take one random step to one of their friends, to the orange dots, the orange dots will have higher degree and higher centrality on average. And the reason this is fantastic is that you can find the orange dots without having to map the network. So now you don't have the cost or headache of doing it. You just pick six people at random, ask them who their friends are, and you give the intervention to their friends. And we've been doing this in a number of settings around the world. For example, in Honduras, where we work in the, in the Western Highlands of Honduras, it's a very poor part of the world. People live on less than $2 a day. Uh, we have mapped the networks. We have another kind of software that we use called Trellis. Uh, this is, uh, which we make publicly available at trellis.yale.edu. This is tablet-based software that can can, um, can um, efficiently map human social networks in the field. And in our first experiment, we had uh, 32 villages and we mapped the networks <coughs> and we randomly assigned the villages to three different targeting algorithms. And in one third of the villages, 5% of the people, in all the villages, 5% of the people were chosen to get the intervention. In one third of the villages, 5% were chosen uh, at, uh, by chance, the randomly, to get it. In another third of the villages, 5% were chosen who had the highest degree. And in another third of the villages, 5% were chosen with the friendship paradox uh, technique. And, uh, and, what we, and what we found uh, is, uh, so the question was, 
if you want to move a whole village and not just individuals uh, to change their behavior, how do you do that? Who do you target? Who creates the most externalities for behavior change? And how can you exploit that? So for example, here is um, you know, how the targeting of two nodes might vary in, uh, in one set of villages. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, orange dots are 5% chosen at random and the yellow dots are 5% chosen uh, so as to be uh, the people with the highest uh, degree. Uh, so same village, different targeting algorithms, you can get a visual sense of the different people that would be chosen. And what we found in this experiment is that by using the friendship nomination technique, here on the x-axis is the day since they were targeted with, in this case, a multivitamin intervention. On the y-axis is the proportion of people that adopted the multivitamin intervention. And you can see that the nomination targeting strategy dominates uh, the other strategies. So this is an illustration of uh, manipulating social contagion. Finally, uh, here's a recent experiment uh, that involves manipulation of position. Now, just to give you an intuitive feel of what this is about, imagine you're a teacher and you have 20 desks nailed in front of you uh, and no one's seated in those desks, but the desks are nailed in, to the floor in a particular arrangement and you have 20 students outside of the classroom with varying abilities. The question is, given that structure of interactions that the nail desks on the floor allow, which student is near which student, where should you position the students in this network of desks to optimize learning in the classroom? Maybe you should put all the better students in the front or in the rear or mix them up, for instance. This is a position intervention. How should workers, for example, be organized within a firm, given the same workers, given the same job functions, given the same organizational arrangements who should go where to optimize the performance of the groups? So this experiment uh, explores this idea of a position intervention and also explores some other ideas involving artificial intelligence. Uh, so here what we did is, is we're exploring the ability of a group of people to solve not a cooperation task, but rather a coordination task. They're dropped into networks and they are told they have to pick a color dissimilar from their neighbors. Uh, orange, yellow, and purple. And they're told that if they work together in this team uh, over the course of five minutes, and they can pick change colors as often as they want, uh, and they can all of them work together to converge in a solution where everyone has a color dissimilar from their neighbors, they'll be paid as a group. Otherwise, they get nothing. The point is they have to coordinate, they have to work together. Uh, and so on the, on the upper left, uh, at the beginning at zero seconds, you can see that people are dropped into the network. They're given initially a random color. The red lines indicate who's in conflict with their neighbors. The, the purple connections indicate that there's no conflict. If you look in the upper left, you'll see there are two orange dots that are connected and they have a red line showing that there's a conflict. Uh, you should have the sense that the dot on the very far left, that orange dot, if they turn to purple, they would eliminate the conflict with their neighbors. That's a smart move for them. At the bottom, we show the progress through the game Time is on the x-axis. The number of color conflicts is on the y-axis. At the beginning, there are 12 color conflicts and that everyone starts picking their colors and working on the game. And by 105 seconds, they've almost solved it. And you can see in the middle, there are two yellow dots and now the group is stuck. They, they can't uh, make a move that allows them to solve the problem. Uh, any, if the yellow, one of the two yellow dots either picks orange or purple, they will increase the number of conflicts in the graph. But interestingly, that's what they have to do. They have to make a counterintuitive move. And in fact, that is what happens. And by the end at 245 seconds, the graph is colored and the people are able to solve uh, the problem. Now in this experiment, what we did is, is we evaluated what we call hybrid systems of humans and bots, of humans and artificial intelligence players and how it might be to work together and how we might be able to add bots with certain kinds of programming to human social systems to make them perform better, and how the position of those bots within the system might affect what happens. We manipulated a couple of things in this experiment. We manipulated how uh, the position of the bots, and that's shown on the rows, 
Uh, on the first row is the bots were put at random. So there were, we dropped three bots into these systems. There were about 15 or 20 people. I'm sorry, there were uh, 20 people and, uh, and uh, approximately and three uh, bots in each group. We had over 4,000 people in 210 groups in this experiment. Uh, and uh, in sometimes we drop the bots in a random position. Sometimes in the middle row, in the bots were put in the middle, in the central position in the network. And sometimes in the bottom row, they were put in the peripheral position in the network. In addition, we manipulated the behavior of the bots. In the first column, the bots had what we call 0% noise. At every one and a half second, they looked at their neighbors and they picked a color with the least conflict with their neighbors every one and a half seconds trying to minimize conflicts. In the middle column, we gave them a little bit of noise. So every one and a half seconds, they picked a color with a minimum conflict, but uh, one out of 10 times, they picked a color at random. And then the final column, they had 30% noise, which is three out of 10 times they picked a random color. Now on the uh, on these uh, nine squares, on the x-axis is the time in seconds, the duration of the game. And on the y-axis is the probability that the group has not solved the coordination game. The orange line shows the sessions with humans only, the control group. And you can see that at the beginning, hundred the humans, and the orange line is the same in all nine of these squares. At the beginning, 100% of the human groups have not solved the problem, but they work their way through, and by the end, two-thirds of the human groups have solved the problem. However, if we add three bots with a, a little noise, 10% noise, in the middle, we can substantially improve it as shown by that, or, that purple line in the middle square, which uh, a larger fraction of the groups uh, is able to solve uh, the problem. So bots with 10% behavioral noise added into the middle of social networks, a little bit of, of kind of random behavior in the middle of this group helps this group of people solve the coordination problem. And in fact, the humans learn to play better by having bots among them. Uh, and, 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 and what's happening is, is that the bots are helping humans to help themselves. And we're building on this work to design and add simple bots to these and other situations involving social dilemmas uh, and collective action problems. We're looking at ways to enhance the ability of groups, coordination, cooperation, communication, evacuation, navigation, and sharing by experimentally adding bots to these groups. And by the way, it's not just about inventing bots to add. When we do these experiments, we gain insights into what humans could do in human-only groups to make it easier for humans to uh, function in these types of uh, situations. What we're doing in my lab, in a sense, is exploring simple kinds of programming, what we call dumb AI, that might make, uh, might make human groups more effective. We're not focused on developing super smart AI to replace human cognition. We're inventing dumb AI to supplement human interaction. And because these dumb agents are added into collections of smart humans, the agents don't have to be that smart. They just have to help a little to help the humans to help themselves. Okay, I'd like to close with one final idea that'll take a couple of slides. Uh, and it has to do with what it means to intervene in a social network, because I think such interventions provide us with a way to manipulate social capital. And to understand one sense of this, consider this idea. What's a point of a connected life? Well, how does it help us as individuals and as a species? And it turns out that networks are a resource that we can all use. Networks are a kind of social capital. Now, most people, when they think about capital, think about money. But really, capital is any stock of resources that can be put to productive use. So capital is a reservoir of wealth that you can produce something with. And two further key ideas about capital are that in order to create capital, you have to invest skill and effort. You have to know something and do something in order to create capital. And second, and more subtle, uh, and an idea that's been keeping me awake for 20 years is that in order to create capital, fundamentally, what you have to do is make changes in a substance that make it yield a higher rate of return than it otherwise would. 
that fundamentally the capital creation process is actually about the transformation of the natural world. What do I mean by that? Well, look at this idea. A farm is a stock of capital. By investing skill and effort to clear the forest, you make the land more productive of fruits and vegetables and grains and flowers, for example. Uh, and, and so you've transformed the natural world. You've transformed a forest into a farm and you've endowed it as a reservoir of wealth, as a source of productive power. So land, especially improved land, is a form of capital. Or you can take this tree and you can invest skill and effort and mill it into lumber. And the lumber is more valuable than the tree because you can do things with the lumber you couldn't do with a tree. Namely, invest still more skill and effort and make a violin. And the violin is more valuable than the lumber because you can do things with a violin that you couldn't do with a lumber. Namely, make music. So at each step of the way, you invest skill and effort and you transform one thing into another thing and you endow, you make it a stock, a, a, a reservoir of wealth and a source of productive power. Well, a key innovation in thinking took place in the 1960s to see people and their skills and talents as a form of human capital. And the chief example of this is education. If you endow someone with skills and knowledge, you change them and you make them more productive. Like you can take this dissolute former graduate student of mine on the far left, uh, who's a drunkard, and you can invest skill and effort and clean him up. And now he's more productive and able to do things he wasn't able to do before. Or you can invest still more skill and effort and give him an education. And now he's still more able to do things than he was able to do before. Well, just like physical capital is created by a change in the material world, and human capital by a change in persons. Social capital in organizations, in companies, in villages, in communities, indeed in our whole society, is a change in the relations among persons, a change that renders the group more productive and capable of doing things it was not previously able to do. And that is the deepest account I can give you of what social networks mean for our lives and why it is and how it is that we can use them to make the world better. Thank you very much.